Hi, I'm Professor Brandon Blankenship, and I'm the Law School Admissions Council Pre-Law Advisor at the University of Alabama at Birmingham. I want to talk a little bit about how to do your personal best on the Law School Admissions test. So the first thing that I would encourage you to do is change the way you think about the Law School Admissions test if you're thinking this way. Many students see the Law School Admissions test or the LSAT as a way to uh, get into law school, a key for admission. And what I would like to encourage you to do is change that way of thinking from just a way to get admitted to a way to get scholarships and awards from the law school. So if you look at those two numbers, if you're looking at a particular law school and you look at the number for the scholarships and awards, it's going to be a higher number than just the admissions number. And the higher number should be your target. Think about, you know, what would the what would the law school experience be for you if, you know, 50 percent of your tuition was paid for, if 70 percent of your tuition was paid for, if 80 percent of your tuition was paid for, you know, you know, what would that change about your law school experience? And it can be significant. So why not make that your target? You know, if that if you if you haven't taken the LSAT yet, uh, you haven't filed your law school application why not? You know, why not just make that your target? So I really encourage you to do that. The second thing that I would uh, encourage you to do is if you haven't done it already, go ahead and go to uh, the Law School Admissions Council, LSAC, and uh, register uh, as a uh, law school applicant. So go ahead and do that registration process. And the reason why that I want you to do that is because as soon as you register, you have the opportunity to take advantage of the training on that site that the Law School Admissions Council partnered with Khan Academy to put together for you. This is a, once you register for LSAC, this is free training. And I, and I would also encourage you, don't underestimate the value of the training simply because it's free. Remember that this is the only training that uh, where the instructors and the designers of the instruction worked with the people who wrote the test. And they certainly have some insight on how to do well on the test if they wrote it. So I want you to go ahead and uh, register on LSAC. Uh, go ahead and start looking at training. The very first thing that I'll ask you to do is a diagnostic test. Uh, now, for me, what I would really encourage you to do is go ahead and take that, that diagnostic test before you do any preparation whatsoever. Before you go out and hire a coach, before you go out and pay for a course, before you do any of the Khan Academy training, very first thing, take the diagnostic test on the LSAC site that's uh, provided through the Khan Academy. Uh, uh, do not go and take an actual LSAT at, as a diagnostic tool to see where you are. Uh, that is always going to be a mistake. You have many different opportunities to take practice tests and diagnostic tests and even real-time tests, just like you would take them in test settings. And I would highly encourage you to do that. Uh, I, I have a, a, a real a key piece of how you will uh, develop a strategy for preparing for the LSAT uh, is going to be based on that diagnostic test. If you uh, start doing prep work before you take that original test, it will skew, uh, it will distort the, um, the areas that you're strong in and the areas that you're weak in. And we, need, we just need to know what those are naturally. So, uh, so let's say you do that, you go and you take the diagnostic test, the first thing I would like to encourage you uh, in is don't freak out. Uh, if, if you didn't get the score that you thought you'd get, if you got a really low score on that diagnostic test, it doesn't matter. Uh, it, it, don't worry about that. Uh, the best thing that I think helps, it understand, helps you understand why I don't freak out about that is, is that maybe for the first time in your life as a student, uh, you are actually transitioning from the, the head knowledge of something to the practical application of it. And so uh, if, you, um, if you've always been a great student and you take the LSAT and, and you don't do well on it, well, that might be because it's a new way of thinking. 
you've never, perhaps you've never been placed in a situation where you have to take something that you've learned in somewhat of a, in somewhat of an abstract setting, like a classroom and apply it to real world scenarios. And so this is about the practice, right? It's not about the knowing, but the actual practice of doing something. And so that's a, that's a mind shift. It's a new way of seeing things. So that's one thing that you have to start training your brain, how to think differently. Another thing would be uh, many of us going into the law school admissions test had never been exposed to logic rules, logic games. And so uh, there's a whole section at least on, on that at this time on the LSAT. And if you, um, if you do poorly on that, don't don't lose sleep about it. Imagine if if you'd never seen German, and you came into class one day, and your teacher handed you a test and said, "Here you go, take some take this German test." You, you might do poorly, right? But what if the teacher said, "I tell you what, eight months from now, uh, I'm going to give you that same test again, and um, I'm going to show you, you know, uh, the basic uh, vocabulary in, in, in German." And I'm going to show you the basic uh, language rules in German. And I'm going to give you some practice so that you can actually practice. Do you think you'd score better in eight months? Well, yeah. So don't freak out about that. I mean, you may be test being tested in areas that you, you've never been exposed to before. And so it's perfectly fine if you get a low score at this point. It's The diagnostic that you take right now is not a predictor of how well you would do on the LSAT. It, you're not tied to that number. But it's an important number because it tells us, you know, what where your strengths are, where, where did you do well on that diagnostic test and where your weaknesses are? Where did you not do so well? And, and we'll we'll divide out our work based on that. OK, so um, the next thing that I would tell you is, OK, now that you have your diagnostic done. The work begins now. I don't know uh, what each of you might have been doing as students, but. For me, this is actual work. This is a disciplined work. If you want your score to uh, improve, if you want your score to be in that scholarship award range, then it's going to require, most likely, it's going to require work from you. And what I would encourage you to do is I would encourage you to think about it like this. You know, look at the difference between I'm working at this job making you know, 10, 15 dollars an hour or I can get, uh, you know, 50 percent scholarship at my law school. Where's the better investment of your time? You know, maybe cut down on your spending and not have to work this job as much so that you can spend your time getting those awards in the long run. You know, if you're looking at you know, just to make math easy. If you're looking at a fifty thousand dollar a year um, institution that you're going to go to for law school, and you get a fifty percent scholarship, uh, that's twenty five thousand dollars, and it could be twenty five thousand dollars a year. That's a lot of hours if you're working at ten to fifteen dollars an hour. So it, if you think about the savings that you can get in law school, it's worth the investment to spend that time preparing and doing the work necessary to get a better score. I uh, just saw a, a letter come through where a, a student got $40,000 annually in scholarships. Well, that's a job, you know, so take the time that's necessary to do the work. If, if you are starting this process of preparing for the law school admissions test and you're like, I'm not sure what this, what work means. Like, like when I'm preparing for the law school admissions test, like before, when a, a professor or a teacher gave an assignment, you know, it was very clear as to what had to be done to do the assignment. I'm not exactly sure. What do I do to work to prepare, you know, to do better on the law school admissions test? Well, if, if you're asking that question, I would really encourage you to read a book called Deep Work by Cal Newport. Now, he has written several books. This is the one that I really would encourage you at this point to read because it will not only help you with your law school admissions test preparation, but it will also help you get through the balance of your college uh, career, and it will help you in your law school as a law school student. So uh, get that book and read it. You can probably get it from the library. Um, Deep Work by Cal Newport. 
and just learn how to do the work necessary. The good news is if you follow Cal's uh, strategy and tactics for doing the deep work, you'll actually have more free time uh, because you'll be able to get rid of that time that you, your friends invite you to do something and you're like, no, I can't go. I got to study for the LSAT. But then you just sit home and feel guilty. You know, you would have felt guilty going cause you weren't studying, but now you feel guilty cause you didn't go cause you're not even studying, you know, you know, like, you're not even sure what to be doing. Well, Cal helps you actually structure your, your study schedule, your work schedule in such a way that you get the work done and then you have the free time to do, you know, the other things in your life that you want to do. So, um, so which course is best? Uh, you know, what, so in, you know, probably one of the top questions that I get, you know, like which one of these courses should I do? Should I do a course? You know, so right now I would say to you that I have not seen any evidence from any of our students or anywhere really across the board, you know, with talking with other law school admissions advisors across the nation. I don't see that one prep course pulls ahead of the other. I think um, I would start out with a uh, Khan Academy. And I think what really matters is whether or not the course is structured in such a way that you will do the work. So if you try one course, like if you try Khan Academy and it just doesn't work for you, uh, then uh, try something else. Try, you know, try, keep, keep working around until you find one of those programs. If you, if you can't work with Khan, you know, find one of those programs that, that works for you. And, and once that, that happens, do the work. That's the most important part. You know, the, the right program is whichever one you will do. And if you will do that, then your your score is going to improve radically. Now, I have some strategy ideas or maybe tactic tactical ideas about this work. Um, the first one is that um, you need to change. Probably, you know, uh, probably you need to change the way that you do your post work, your post test. So here's what I mean by that is. Um, Typically, what we're taught to do in our United States uh, educational system is when we're going through assignments, once we get something completed or done, or let, think about a test question, you get a test question right, or a practice test question right, what do you do? You're done. You got it right, move on. Get the, you know, go to the next one. If you get it wrong, you might stop and think about, why did I get this wrong? But um, but what I want to encourage you to do is what is what's called reflective learning on every single problem you work to prepare for the LSAT. Now, you won't do this on the LSAT itself, but as you're preparing, I want you to consider uh, adding a whole process of reflective learning while you're preparing for the law school admissions test. What do I mean by that? Well, let's say you work a problem, a practice problem, and then you go check your answer and you got it right. I want you to stop for a moment and I think you should take a pen and pad and, and if you can't take a pen and pad, then take a, you know, however you do notes, but I would take a pencil and a pad or a pen and a pad and I would write out, this is what I was thinking when I got this right. This is the process that I went through to get this right. You know, I, I did step one and then I step, did step two and then did step three and it came, you know, I got the right result. So it doesn't have to be a long process, might be 30 seconds, might be a minute, you know, uh, could be longer. That doesn't matter. I mean, like just do the reflective work. Um, at first, that might seem awkward, you know, like you're the first time you do it might take longer. That's fine. But what you're doing is you're reinforcing in your mind the process that you did to get the right answer so that when you see a similar problem in the in the future, your mind will be reinforced as to how to process through that and get it right. Remember the law school admissions test um, is not just getting the right answer. It's getting the right answer in a time period, you know, in a restricted time period. And so um, uh, you want to you know, train your mind when it gets the right answer to continue to use that process so that it can use it faster and faster. The second thing is when you get a practice problem wrong, same thing. You know, stop and ask yourself, uh, why did I get this wrong? What was the process that I went through to get to get it wrong? 
and also write down what could I have changed in the process to have gotten the, the answer right. Again, we're training our brain. Don't go down that, that wrong path again. The next time you see a problem like this, go down this right path. Use this right process. And that's a highly, highly effective way to um, improve your score dramatically. If you don't look at got it right, done, or got it wrong, I'll move on and get the next one right. But you stop and reflect on each problem as to why you got it right or why you got it wrong. What were the reasons behind why you got it right or wrong? Okay. Now, um, this next thought is going to be, or our tactic is going to seem a little nuancy to some of you, a little goofy to some of you. Do it anyway. Um, so what I want you to do is I want you to, um, I want you to plan your day in such a way so that the very last thing that you do before you go to sleep at night is work one LSAT problem and do the reflective piece as part of your work. So not a whole section, not a whole test, one problem. And I want you to work that one problem. And then I want you to do the reflective piece talking about, you know, why I got this right or why I got this wrong and what could I, I could have done different to get it right. Close it, go to sleep. Let that be the last thing you think about. Not an episode of something on Netflix, you know, not talking to your significant other, you know, not worrying about a bill that you can't get paid. The last thought that I want you to have is about uh, this, this one problem that you did right before you went to sleep. Uh, I am convinced that part of the uh, improving your score on the law school admissions test is thinking differently. That doesn't happen like that. You can't cram for it like you can most tests in high school and college. You've got to literally change the way your brain approaches problems and solves problems. And so a good time to do that is to let your brain reflect on it while you're sleeping. So uh, if you will do that and journal your progress, then you won't have to take my word for it. You will see your progress and, and it will reinforce this practice for you. You'll, you'll do it more and more. I've had student after student after student come back to me and say, you know, I thought you were a little kooky when you told me that, but when I did it, it, it worked. So, um, so which problem do you pick? So the reason we wanted to know the weak area and the strong area is, is because I want you to start with that problem you do every night. I want that to be in an area where you're the weakest. So what that means is going to take a little bit longer because you're going to get it wrong and you have to write out the process of why you got it wrong and what you could have done to get it right. But that's where I think you should start in the, in the area of the LSAT where you are the weakest. And, um, and you want to do that every single night is work in that area. As you get 45 days away from your test date, I want you to shift that from the weak air, weakest area to the strongest area. So um, what's the rationale behind that? Well, the rationale is uh, you can improve in both places, but the place you're going to improve the easiest and the most are in your strengths area. So uh, if we're sitting back six, eight months in preparation, then I want to be just nibbling away at my weaknesses. I want to get a little better, a little better, a little better, a little better. But then as I get within that 45 to 45 day window of the test date, I want to uh, leverage my strengths and I can do that by reinforcing them right before I go into uh, right before I go into the uh, test. So I'm not saying and this is my last point. I'm not saying that that's all you should do is that nightly exercise. I'm saying in addition to whatever strategy you've worked out to do your deep work to prepare for the LSAT. Do this nightly reflective process. All right, so here's the last point. Um, there are apps right now where you can do practice problems while you're standing in line waiting to get in somewhere. You can do them in the you can do them in the car when you're 
riding as a passenger, for example, don't do that. Um, that is your, if you do those types of apps, if you, if you just sit down and work on, you know, problem for five minutes and get up and go do something else, you're training your mind and your body, um, uh, in the exact opposite discipline that it will need for the actual test. The actual test is for long periods of time and you have to sit there and be engaged for those long periods of time. And what I would really suggest that you do is that you do your preparation work in those same segments. So why not carve out 90 minutes in your day and do deep work for 90 minutes? At first, it may seem like torture for some of you, especially if you struggle with attention. That's fine. Just set a timer and for 90 minutes, put your backside in a chair and have that work material before you and force yourself to be there for 90 minutes. If, you're, if your brain travels away and you got to come back, you know, like you got to refocus, you know, every five minutes, fine. That's fine. But just discipline yourself to start sitting in that chair for that 90 minutes and working on LSAT materials. What you will find is at first, for some of you, you know, some of you will be just fine. First time you do the 90 minutes, you're done. You're like, yeah, I got this. But some of you, it's actual torture. Like you've actually hurt doing it. Okay, I get that. Um, it gets easier. You know, just push through the pain. Just imagine you're at a mental gym. That's fine. Just push through the pain do the work, stay in the chair. What you'll see is that your body and mind will be, start being acclimated to that 90 minute chunk of time. And you'll be able to think for longer and longer periods of time. And that's what's going to be necessary to do your personal best on the LSAT.